trends in the lower middle market M&A space and do we expect things to change? I'm Arthur Petropoulos, managing partner here at Hillview Partners. We're a middle market, lower middle market M&A capital advisory firm helping companies generating a million to $10 million a year, pre-tax earnings or EBITDA, sell their companies and find capital. So as we have just had this election and as we're chatting with people and kind of the run up to the election and as we're heading into Q4 and in Q4 of the year, a lot of times people have said, what are you seeing in the market? What do the trends look like? What are you seeing in business exits, values, capital participants? And so we thought it'd be a good idea to make a video today just to cover kind of three high level observations that we're seeing in the market and what the implications are if you are contemplating potentially selling your business or seeking capital. So the first observation is that there is lots of activity for cash flowing businesses. And so still there's lots of headlines of the spigot running dry relative to earlier stage companies, venture capital businesses, that valuations for some publicly traded companies being overvalued, undervalued, and there's a lot of dialogue in that regard as well as to kind of the capital flows there. But for the space that we function in, that we are obsessed with, the $1 million to $10 million EBITDA business that is cash flowing, that does a real thing, and what we mean by that, provides services, products, has an offering that solves a problem for its client base, that has a client base, that again, to flog a dead horse, generates positive cash flow on a consistent basis. There is a tremendous appetite for that. If you are the person who is buying companies for a private equity firm, or even within the corporate development group within a large organization, and we used to have the saying in, in finance and I was not an Ivy League guy, so I had some ire for it, but they always said, no one gets fired for hiring the guy from Harvard. And jokes aside, in the business world, nobody gets fired for buying or acquiring the cash flowing company that's been consistent and has a durable competitive advantage. And so, if you think of it, the focus, there's always a focus on cash flow positive businesses, but as other elements of the spectrum run a little drier, you can see that there's bigger rotation. Actually, if you think just of a consistent supply, which actually there's becoming more and more activity, even assuming a consistent supply but an increased demand, obviously that is provides upward force to the market. So secondly, there are more participants every day entering the lower middle market space. And so again, supply and demand, as demand goes up, if supply stays the same, pricing for things goes up. And so we have more demand not by just virtue of rotating people that are already call it participants in the acquisition market, but also new entrants into the market. And that can be in the form of new private equity firms, new search funds, new independent sponsors, new family offices. You've got a lot of wealth trading hands, both intergenerationally. You've got people that are exiting stakes from early stage businesses that have subsequently gone public or have been bought from private equity. And there's a lot of cash looking to be redeployed into the universe of M&A, a large place that people are looking at. And now there's, and to build on that, there's courses being taught at every school at this point of entrepreneurship through acquisition. And that's not a new concept, but the packaging of it and people being able to get more educated. I mean, the proliferation of just online influencers, the Cody Sanchez's, the Alex Hormozis of the world, people who are advocating for the acquisition and running of businesses, which is a great thing because there's a huge amount of these businesses that are owned by a baby boomer generation that is retiring, that is looking for some transition plans, and not every one of these companies is going to be bought by private equity or publicly traded strategic company. And so this new entrance to the market are creating real demand and in turn increasing price and making terms more aggressive. And kind of on the corollary of that relative to the capital side of things, there are more strategic capital providers. And so banks that are getting more comfortable with acquisition loans, given that it is more in demand from acquirers. You know, I think ever since the 2008, 2009, really up until the last couple of years, many banks were in the pigeonhole of, of just lending on real estate. And what I think the interest rate changes over the last two years have really elucidated or brought to light to them is that they're overweight real estate in many ways and that they've got huge portfolios of real estate assets, which again, a core asset at a bad leverage is still a bad situation to be in. And it's not to say all banks are in that, but the collapse of some of these banks has indicated or put on the radar to people that they really need to mix up the duration and composition of the loan portfolios. And so there's lots of banks that are coming to us, which is a new concept, not that they're coming to us, but what they're telling us is that, look, we have too much real estate. We don't want to do more real estate deals. We want more corporate deals. We want more acquisitions. We want to support more existing businesses that have growth ideas. And so the banks kind of sharpening their pencils and looking at acquisitions in a way that perhaps they hadn't for the last 20 years is also creating more uh, firepower, if you will, supporting the broader acquisitions in the market. And lastly, for a third observation is relative to larger strategics. Now, this is an interesting one, is that for a while, over the last five to 10 years, let's call it, the larger strategic, so these can be public or private companies, but say the multi-billion dollar companies, the, the 
upper multiple hundreds of millions of dollars of companies that are looking to buy specific companies, bolt-ons, add-ins, tuck-ins, they were looking a little more broadly as to just things that made sense. And so that could be something that just does more of what they do and it was a way of kind of grabbing more business. And they really kind of came down, let's call it downstream to the sub 10, sub $5 million EBITDA space, which historically strategics really have not uh, been as involved with. Typically, you'll see aggregation strategies via private equity or financial buyers that would aggregate. And then once they were in that five to $10 million EBITDA range, would then kind of sell the aggregation that had been integrated up the food chain to the strategics. But the strategics had come down to look at an array of, of situations. And what the takeaway has been from people that we've spoken to and that we interact with on a daily basis is that looking back in the last five to 10 years, the deal that made the most sense and the most impact for these strategics were not those that just purely had a positive cash flow, right? If a business, if a strategic that is making a billion dollars a year buys a company that's making $2 million a year in profit, the integration cost of that can be a bit of a toss up relative to just kind of juicing some of their business development or organic sales growth. And so that being said, where they did say there were meaningful impacts or where things moved the needle were where there was access or capability considerations in the deal, right? And so we've hammered that all the time in our videos saying businesses sell on fundamentals, access, and capabilities. And now what we're seeing and hearing from strategics is that they're saying, look, it doesn't make sense for us to go too far downstream unless there is a compelling access or a compelling capability. You have access to a customer base that we dearly want. You have access or you provide a solution that is unique and innovative that we could then sell to our much larger list of clients. And so if you can emphasize the access or the capabilities, the appetite from the strategic is still there. However, just kind of the plain vanilla deal, the hey, we're gonna send this deal to 10,000 people in a mailing list and pray for the phone to ring deal is not getting the attention of the strategics the way that it perhaps did five to 10 years ago. Now, can, has that been counterbalanced to some degree by the financial acquirers? Sure. However, if you're going out there to sell a business, you want all of the eyeballs on it, strategics, financials, everything in between, all of the uh, Venn diagram, half and half type situations as well. You just want more eyeballs because it is truly iterations of evaluation and discussion that will ultimately push up all terms in a transaction. And so let's recap these three observations. First observation, lots and lots of activity for cash flowing businesses. Second observation, more and more new incremental participants in the low middle market M&A space. And three, strategics have not retrenched from the lower middle market. However, they are only really looking for access and capabilities, build versus buy considerations to enter deals of that small of size, small being in the broader sense for these multi-billion dollar companies. And again, necessitating the emphasis of access and capabilities and the proper characterization as we say, right story to the right audience in the right process in order to get the strategics to look at companies of the size that we are largely representing. And so lastly, our take on whether we think anything is going to change in the future. And the simple answer is no. We think that 2025 in particular is going to be a real continuation of what we're seeing now. More participants, more interest, more need to crystallize and really craft the narratives for the businesses that are going out to the market, but having a wonderful audience, appetite, and ability to negotiate optimal terms for our clients relative to their objectives of selling or securing capital. The lower middle market at large, and it's really been the space I can say personally I've been involved with over the last 20 years, has really become more efficient. I don't wanna say less of the wild west, but there's much more of a specified process, largely that we've been carving out and crystallizing to make sure that these companies get to excellent outcomes where back in the day there would be a very kind of thin audience and a thin process that wouldn't yield optimal terms. Now we can facilitate the sale of a company that makes a million, two million, three million to ten million dollars in EBITDA in the same process in the same fashion yielding the same results on a relative basis as you would to a larger scale bulge bracket investment banking type of process. That's the goal. That's what generates the outcomes. And that's what we're proud to do every day. And so that's the thought for today. What trends are we seeing in the middle market and low middle market M&A investment banking space? That's it. Hope the week's going well for everyone. Keep pushing forward. God bless. See you all next time.